I'm kind of new at all this podcast stuff, so I don't have all the bells and whistles that, and the music that some of these podcasts have. But frankly, uh, I may eventually put it on, but frankly, I don't see the need for it because basically anybody that's interested in my podcast will be interested in what I have to say, not some little 15-minute blip of music. And what I have to say will either you will either find interesting or you'll be bored to tears and click away in a few seconds. But anyway, today I'm going to talk about the first time and hopefully the only time I saw a guy get shot. Now, I grew up kind of in many, many years ago in Charlotte, North Carolina. We had a five-acre uh piece of property. We were surrounded mostly by woods and uh, lakes and stuff like that. And uh, maybe about a quarter mile away was this little country store that I had my actual first job in. And about, I don't know, 10, 12 years old, something like that. And uh, I made 50 cents an hour. That tells you how long ago it was. Now, All my friends, uh, I was, I think, maybe, like I said, 10 or 12, somewhere like that. And all my friends, though, they were like 16 years old, and they all had cars and drove. So I hung out with them a lot. So this one particular night, uh, I decided, or we had planned, uh, one of my friends who had a car, I would sneak out of the house, and uh, we would go fishing. There was a lake near us that was uh, had all-night fishing. So uh, we thought we'd go fishing all night, and I would sneak back in the house before it was time to go to school. So this guy waits at the end. His name was William. He waits at the end of the driveway for me. I sneak out of the house. And as we drive out of my grandparents' driveway, we have to go past this little country store. And as we passed this country store, one of our co-workers had left his car there overnight because it was uh, something was wrong with it, and he left it there overnight. So we saw these three guys, uh, and, and now it's, you know, it's like you know, 1 o'clock in the morning or something. So we saw these three guys siphoning gas out of our co-worker's car. So we thought, well, maybe we should go wake up the owner and tell him. And the owner's name was Mr. Rideout. So we drive to the owner's house. He lived about a mile away, and we knock on the door. Now, Mr. Rideout was, uh, he loved guns. He was a big gun owner. In fact, he had a whole wall that stretched the entire wall full of a gun collection. Had just about every kind of gun you can imagine. So we told him what was going on. He walks over to the wall, and... uh, I had, I knew from watching old war movies and stuff like that and, uh, and knowing what a German Luger looks like, and he picks off the shelf or off the hook a German Luger and puts the uh, bullets in it and puts the gun down his belt, you know, in front of his pants. And I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be interesting. So we follow him up to the store, and he pulls into the dry, to the parking lot, kind of right next to the guys that are siphoning gas. And William pulls his car down maybe, you know, 10, 15 yards away. And Mr. Rideout gets out, and he says to the guys, uh, please step away from the car. What you're doing is illegal. And the guys were all drunk, obviously drunk, and they all kind of responded with, fuck you, asshole. And uh, Mr. Rideout says, I'm just going to ask you one more time, then I'm going to call the police. And they kept, you know, cursing at Mr. Rideout. So, you know, maybe five yards away, or a little bit from the car, was one of these old, you know, uh, phone booths, you know, like the Get Smart Superman phone booths, you know, with the folding door that you push in. Once again, that shows you how many years ago it was. So, uh, Mr. Rideout goes into the phone booth, shuts the door, and uh, uh, begins to make a phone call. 
And at that point, I'm like 15 yards away or something like that. And I have this little knife. It's a little pocket knife. It's about the size of your finger. And I pull it out, and like I'm thinking, okay, if things get rough, I'm going to, you know. And then, you know, at some point I realized how stupid that was. I must look like an idiot with this little pocket knife, and Mr. Rideout's got a gun, and these are three grown men. What the hell am I going to do with this little tiny knife? But anyway, Mr. Rideout, uh, as he completes the phone call, the three men surround the phone booth or, or block the front door. And so Mr. Rideout opens the door of the phone booth and kind of pushes his way through the three men and runs down the parking lot maybe, I don't know, uh, 10, 15 yards from, from the men. And he pulls out this German Luger from his waist. And me and William are like standing like, like you know, a little bit further away and we're going, oh, shit. Shit's about to hit the fan. And when Mr. Rideout pulls out the gun, he points it at the three guys, but he doesn't point it at eye level. He actually holds the gun at his waist, but pointing toward the three guys, but he's got the gun at, his, at waist level. And as soon as he pulls the gun out, two of the guys, there were two tall guys and one kind of short guy. The two tall guys... Uh, Actually, oh, man, cool it. Okay, no problem here. You know, no problem. And they actually back away. The little short guy who was obviously extremely drunk, he's going, you son of a bitch, motherfucker. Go ahead and shoot me. I dare you. And Mr. Rideout said, uh, don't tip me. Don't tip me because if you take a step forward, uh, I'm going to shoot you. So, uh the guy takes a step forward, and, and Mr. Rideout holds off, and he says, listen, I'm going to give you one more warning. If you take another step toward me, I'm going to have to shoot you. And the guy yells, you know, a few obscenities, like, you know, fuck you. You're not going to shoot at me. You know, I don't, you don't have the guts. So the guy actually takes another step toward Mr. Rideout, and all you see is a flash of, like, light coming out of the muzzle. And you literally see this guy's leg between the knee and the ankle just explode. I mean, you just see this huge, gigantic explosion. Uh, it's all, it was just, oh, I don't know, it's hard to describe, but it was just kind of an explosion on his leg. And his blood just started pouring out of his bone and leg, you know. And the... Uh, absolutely amazing thing is this guy stood there for probably I'm guessing 30 seconds or 45 seconds it was like an eternity he didn't fall he didn't flinch he didn't do anything he just stood there and finally he looked Mr. Wright out dead in the eye and he said damn you're a good shot <laughs> and, and then he collapsed and fell to the ground by that time, cops were all over the place. You know, obviously they arrested the guy. And, uh, and me and William were like just there with our jaw, you know, dropped down to the parking lot pavement because we had never seen anybody been shot before. Uh, now, we all had the, the kind of the, uh, uh, I don't know, funny kind of ending to the whole story is we all had to go to court and sit in court and the uh, they wanted me and William to testify if we had to uh, we never and, and we never had to when our kids came up but you know as you sit in in court you have to watch other people's cases before you and what was funny is one of the cases that was uh, went before the judge before us was uh, a guy named Big John and Big John was a, a guy, he was about, uh, got to be 350 pounds. I mean, he lived up to the name Big John. And he had the pimp hat and the pimp, uh, you, know, uh, you know, suit and tie and shoes and everything on. Well, Big John ran an undercover shoplifting school in Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, uh, which is kind of funny in itself. 
and they had the police had been looking for Big John for quite a while, trying to nail him. And the way they finally nailed him, they nailed one of his students. That's so funny to say that a student in a shoplifting school. Uh, and this lady, she was a big lady, maybe you know a little bit less weight than Big John, but pretty hefty lady. And what she would do is she would go in stores, and she had this big package under her arm. And they had the package there in the courtroom. And it was a big package, and it was kind of wrapped like a present. Like you'd go in the store, you'd buy something and, and get it wrapped as a present. And I guess it looked less suspicious that way. And she would hold this big package next to her, the side of her, uh, to her side, underneath her arm. And, and one side would be pressed against her side. But the side that was hidden and pressed against her side, there was a little flap door in there. You know, nobody else could see it, but there was a little flap door. And she would just go down the aisles, and as Big John would teach her how to do it, you know, where nobody would notice, she would just pick up merchandise and, and, uh, and put it uh, in this flap door on, on, in the package. So they finally caught this lady who actually squealed on Big John, but I just thought that was kind of a, uh, you know, just a funny, funny uh, thing to see a, a guy named Big John running a shoplifting school. <laughs> it just was hilarious. Even at 10 years old, I thought this was hilarious. Okay, well, that's my story. Uh, please tune in to my next podcast. You never quite know what you're going to hear from me. So take care and thanks for listening.